All right, friends, so we're going to continue our chats about correlation. This time, correlational strategies that go beyond correlation. So correlation actually represents a whole family of statistical analyses that you can utilize. We're going to explore it a little bit deeper here, and we'll actually visit more of it in Chapter 15 uh, as well. So we'll start re with regression, right? So regression or regression strategies, there's actually several types, is essentially used to predict. We're trying to foresee the future, right, as it were, with our statistical crystal ball. Um, basically, it's looking at what we know about one variable and how that might be utilized to help us predict another variable, right? So um, if we know what season it is, for example, we might have a better idea of how much that clothing will cost or what clothing is being sold in the stores. We're using uh, what we know about the variable X to predict the potential outcomes for the variable Y. Uh, the example I like to use in this, by the way, is the SAT as a predictor for college success. Um, it's actually a good predictor. As much as I don't like the SAT and as much as there's been some, I don't want to say controversy, but discussion over whether or not it's an adequate uh, or accurate test, um, it's good. It's good. For what it is, it is good, right? And the reason why it is good is because there's a lot of data, in fact, millions upon millions of data points that uh, show that the SAT does have a good connection to uh, your prediction for college success. However, the big consideration of this is that the SAT is only one marker for potential success in college. This is why universities also look at your GPA, like your, they'll look at your extracurriculars, they'll look at your um, letters of recommendation, they'll look at writing samples, because the more good, accurate predictors, the more uh, predictors that, that um, uniquely contribute to the prediction, the better off the prediction typically is. Right. And so especially when you're talking about a, a multi, uh, probably multi billion, definitely multi billion dollar uh, industry like uh, college, um, you have to keep in mind that being good at predicting is good, but being better could be the difference between fiscal solvency and not. So we have to be very mindful of how important some of this prediction becomes. What we're going to start with is the basic form, right? Linear regression, we'll talk more about this on the next slide as well. Linear regression is essentially an extension of the good old equation y equals mx plus b. If you think back toward, to algebra and geometry, when your teacher swore to you every day of the rest of your life, you're going to use this equation, so memorize it. Today is that day. Today is that day. So somewhere your geometry or algebra teacher is probably filled with joy and they don't know why. You're using it again, all right? In this case, I am trying to connect in a linear fashion what's going on with y as a result, or I don't want to say as a result, in light of what's going on with x, right? So, for example, if it's Halloween and my kids are uh, getting into their uh, East, their Halloween candy, I can predict how late they'll try and stay up depending on how much of the candy they eat. I know how much candy they eat, and therefore I can predict the outcome variable, the y variable in this case, based on that, right? It's based on correlation, and therefore it creates what's called a linear relationship. The more candy they eat, the later they'll probably stay up, right? So as we learn more about these, these variables, or as we get more data, we'll find actually more accuracy and so on and so forth, the more things you can build in there too. So for example, if I also knew how much candy they ate already and how early they got up in the morning, that's an even better predictor because I'll have a better idea of how tired they are, how long we went trick-or-treating, another good predictor because if they walk quite a bit, they're probably more tired. You get the idea, you get the idea. So the equation itself, as I said, if I'm going to flip it, flip back. So it is y equals mx plus b, but it's an extension of that. It's a variation. It's, it's uh, y equals mx plus b's fancier cousin. There's the top. y equals beta. That looks like a b, but it's a beta. y equals beta 0 plus beta 1. And if you're taking notes, I would change that x to an x subscript 1. Beta, uh, beta 1 x1 is the way it should read, and I'll tell you for why in a second. So this equation att uh, attempts to establish how we can predict y just by knowing x, okay? And obviously the betas are just placeholders. You would actually have numbers in place of the betas if you were actually doing this in real life, just as in y equals mx plus b would ultimately have numbers in it. So y is going to be the dependent criterion or outcome variable, right? This is the predicted variable. All four of those terms mean the same thing. They are synonymous, right? So y is what we're trying to predict. x is the predictor variable. As we'll talk about in a second, also predictor variables. That's why I had you label this one x1, because there can actually, in fact, be many x's, many predictors that help you establish what the uh, outcome variable will look like. Beta 0 is the regression constant, right, which is essentially the y intercept if you think back to that. So beta 0 is um, uh, b in the, uh, in the y equals mx plus b. And then beta 1 is a regression coefficient or slope, and this is uh, essentially m 
from y equals mx plus b, but it's the slope of a line that connects y, uh, x and y, right? I know it might look a little daunting at first, but if you think about it in the context of y equals mx plus b, it hopefully will help it kind of sit, sit in and, and, and nest itself in your brain. Um, it's fairly straightforward. It's one of those things that once you do a little bit, and, and in subsequent courses you might get a chance to do a bit more of it, and once you do a bit of it, it actually will become more um, clear. These equations can get pretty wild though. Um, I had a job prior to teaching where I was designing these equations, but they would have, I think the longest one I built had like 32 predictors in it. Um, which was just a monumentally geek ta geeky task. I loved it, but um, yeah, very, very geeky task. But anyway, this is all based on prediction and the, uh, the cost of successful prediction or unsuccessful prediction. So it's going to form a line like so. I'm not going to belabor this point, but um, age and shoe size, for example, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. Essentially, we're trying to form the line based on the data that we know. You might think back to when you took algebra or geometry, this might have been called the line of best fit. Uh, essentially, we're trying to establish the equation for the line of best fit. Multiple regression is the same thing, but in this case, we have more than one predictor. As I just mentioned, that massive uh, equation that I built that had, I think, 32 in it, we are essentially trying to predict uh, one variable utilizing many other uh, uh, predictive variables, right? So standard multiple regression is essentially just throwing all the predictor variables into the equation at one time to see what happens, right? Um, this, would be, oh, this would be what happens when you go ahead and uh, submit a college application. You give them the GPA, your GPA rather, excuse me, your um, SAT scores, your letters of rec, your extracurriculars, and your transcripts. And you say, there you go, you're throwing all the predictors into the equation at once, and then they will come back and say, we did the calculations, in fact, you are accepted, we expect you to get no lower than a 3.0 or whatever, whatever. They don't actually say that. Usually they just say if you're accepted or rejected. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of this process is almost automated. Uh, is, is in fact automated. It's automated by these equations. So universities, especially larger ones, have these predictive equations that they have built based on the uh, expectation of success from students coming in. And keep in mind, I don't know if, I don't know if you all are aware of this, but universities don't like students to come if they're not going to graduate. It doesn't look good for their numbers. They need to make sure that a certain percentage of students graduate. So it's important to them that if they're going to accept you into their school, that you do in, 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 do eventually graduate, uh, and hopefully in a timely manner. Right. So this would be um, this is would be how it's entered. I also compare this to crockpot cooking. You throw all the ingredients in at once, turn that sucker on, and hope for the best. Right. That's going to be kind of the metaphorical way we we deal with multiple uh, regression or sim simultaneous multiple regression, more specifically. Stepwise, another variation on this. Let me throw all the, there we go. Uh, stepwise multiple regression takes it a little bit further, right? So this one is a little bit more precise. Essentially what we're doing is dropping in one predictor at a time based on its strength, right? So the one with the highest correlation, the X and the Y with the highest correlation, you throw that X in first. The next highest correlation, that one next, and so on and so forth until you get through all of your predictors, right? They're entered in based on the strength of the prediction that they create. And if you're cooking, this would be the equivalent of cooking with the main ingredient first and then other ones could come along afterwards, right? And I've already used this term. I really want to emphasize this term to you. The term uniquely contribute. We only want to utilize variables that uniquely contribute. So if you tell me your SAT score, do I really need to know your ACT score? The answer is no. The answer is no, because I know the SAT and the ACT both are intended to measure the same thing. So the ACT score, in fact, doesn't uniquely contribute to my knowledge or my ability to predict your potential for success at our school, right? So unique contribution is very important. Um, just kind of keep that in mind. We'll revisit that in uh, the second part of this lecture as well as uh, chapter 15. Hierarchical, I hate this word, so hard to say. Hierarchical multiple regression. Oh, sorry, Oops, sorry, there we go. Hierarchical multiple regression. In this case, predictor variables are entered one at a time based on uh, hypothesis or theory. It says hypothesis there. It could also be existing theory, right? Or prior research, you know, research from prior research. Or excuse me, theory from prior research, right? So what you're doing is you're essentially cooking from a recipe, metaphorically. First you put in the chicken, then you put in the garlic, put in the butter, whatever, like so, right? You're putting in one ingredient at a time in a pre- uh, predetermined order in order to find um, kind of find the same conclusions or find similar results as have been previously utilized right 
The nice thing about this, as the second bullet point indicates, is it eliminates confounds, not all, but most, and it also allows you to test mediational hypothesis. Let me first speak about uh, eliminating confounds. We'll talk about mediational hypothesis in the next lecture, uh, next uh, slide, excuse me. So because you are basically cooking from a recipe that already exists, it's already been tested, it's already been vetted, it's already been examined, reassessed, reevaluated. Right? So there should not be any ingredients on the list that are not necessary, thus eliminating confounds. Right? You're not going to put in the, the red chili flakes if they're not necessary. Right? So any of the confounds that might have existed hopefully are gone. That's the idea. Okay? I don't know why I use this cooking metaphor. I can't cook. So I don't know why I even came up with this. My wife is an extraordinarily good cook. Uh, I don't know where this even came from. Maybe I was hungry when I wrote the lecture. Anyway. When we consider a mod, uh, mediational hypothesis, right? So before we get there, let's talk about how sometimes variables are confounds because their effects overlap, right? So if I'm cooking and I go to use uh, garlic powder, do I also need to include garlic, right? And so I, mean, I imagine many of you are listening to this lecture and you're like, yes, yes, they do two different, very different things. Do they though? Do they? I'm just saying, right? They have similar effects. They're both based on garlic. They kind of overlap. If I put garlic salt in there, do I need to put garlic powder, right? I actually don't know, but I would assume that because they are similarly, have similar effects, it creates this confound, right? Mediational hypotheses are what I've been preaching about from day one in this course, and hopefully you've listened and internalized it. Uh, at the very least, you're probably bored of hearing me say it. There are always third variables. Every time we look at X and Y, there is always a Z. You cannot forget this. Always a Z variable, right? And if we think about the relationship between ice cream sales and violent crime, the Z variable in this case is temperature. When we utilize hierarchical multiple regression, we are able to actually do what's called a mediational hypothesis or examine a mediational analysis where we essentially say, okay, we are utilizing these predictors, but which one is like the fundamental predictor, right? If we're trying to predict ice cream sales, we can use gun crime. Uh, if we're trying to predict gun crime, we can use ice cream sales. But if you have the intelligence, and of course you all do, you think, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, but what is driving both of them? What is the underlying predictor that drives both? And that is the Z variable, what I refer to as the Z, the Z variable, but it is the mediational variable, in this case of temperature, right? So as we, as we talk about the second half of this, this lecture and then also talk throughout the rest of this course, you've got to keep that in the back of your mind. My little nasal voice saying Z variable, Z variable. Always think of that other variable and truth be told, it's almost always multiple Z variables. There's almost always multiple components that come into it. But what is really driving this relationship? What is the, um, the underlying factor that really explains uh, so much else of the statistical relationship? <laughs>